Good morning, everyone. Uh, start with some quick introductions. Um, who here considers themselves a data engineer, someone who works with streaming, someone who works with databases? Okay. Who here considers themselves a data scientist? Okay. And who here is someone who'd be comfortable if a colleague came to you with a statistical question? Okay, so pretty good distribution. I hope none of you have questions for me. So um, I've worked as a data scientist and with data scientists for some time. I'm not a statistician. My background is computer science research and computer systems development. So my bias is towards hacks that are likely to be useful. If you need to be really sure that you're actually modeling a joint distribution, consult a statistician licensed in your jurisdiction. I'm going to share some techniques that I've found useful in building machine learning systems and building other systems. It's not going to be an exhaustive list, but I hope you'll learn something new or learn some new applications of things you already know. Um, and I'll just s start with a disclaimer. I'm not speaking from my employer here. These are all my own opinions. And again, uh, we're, we're going to be focused on hacks rather than on absolute uh, you know, potential correctness or certainty. Here's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to start with applications. I think it's important to start with applications because applications drive what we care about with synthetic data. We'll review some high-level challenges that you might run into in generating synthetic tabular data. We'll look at the simplest possible approach of, of sampling from individual features, how we can do that, what we can use it for. And then we'll look at some ways to improve on those simple samples by taking into account joint distributions, correlations between features, and so on. We'll then look at how to take what we know about the real world to produce a better model of the process that's generating that data that we want to simulate. And finally, we'll look at some other approaches that are either more automated or more involved that I think you'll be better equipped to look into after you've sort of thought about some of the themes we'll consider in this talk. So starting with applications, I'll, I'll start with, with um, an application that I think is relevant to those of you who are data engineers here, and that's evaluating query performance. If you have a system that you haven't put into production yet, you might have a small data set and a bunch of queries, and you want to learn how your database will handle a much larger one. So if we have a join, for example, we might say we're joint taking all the you know, rows from one relation and all the rows from another so that we have some criterion that's satisfied, and we might produce a larger relation from doing this. Now, if we have a small data set, we may say, well, hey, this, this, this performs adequately. Great. Right? But we, we may not actually have the large data set that we care about until we're actually running the system in production, by which time it may be too late to dramatically re-architect it because it's slow or because it doesn't meet our latency requirements. So in order to do this, what are the things we care about in this data set? Well, we might care about the key relationships across tables, like what is the intersection between these fields? What's the cardinality of the intersection between these fields? You know, given that we have a field in one table, how likely is it that we're going to see it in the other? Um, we might also want to look at sort of individual key and value distribution details, things like skew can really change how we might want to execute a query. And I think, I think that's interesting enough that we should look at it separately. So, Data skew is something that you often hear about in the context of distributed processing systems like Spark. Um, many execution models are susceptible to this, and it can be a performance pitfall for a lot of systems. I'm not going to tell you how to avoid skew. I'm gonna, we're going to talk about how we can use synthetic data to identify that our system is susceptible to skew. So the idea is that if records are unevenly distributed across tasks, if the distribution of records is skewed, many processes may be idle while waiting for another partition to finish processing. So if we're executing a query on a partitioned relation and you know, we've sort of filtered it down um, so that there are different numbers of values in each partition, the time it takes to process the largest partition will influence the lower bound on the time it takes to process the entire query plan. So Say we've run some part of our query, we're at some stage in evaluating a query when we've filtered a bunch of things out, but the things we filtered out aren't evenly distributed across the partitions. Well, then we have you know, a certain number of records left in each partition after filtering, and we might not be making the best use of resources here because we're waiting for that largest partition to finish before we can go on to the next task. But in real world systems, data skew is often a lot worse than this, right? We have all of these pictures fitting on a slide without using a log scale. If you think about a social network, right? If you said, I want to track everyone's interaction 
with a social media post. And I'm, I've keyed this by user, and I've keyed this by time, and I just have a, a stream of these things, and I want to say what was the latest for each user with a query. Well, if it's my Instagram account that I haven't updated since 2020, that's going to be a much easier query than if it's Cristiano Ronaldo's Instagram account, or Taylor Swift, or Beyonce, or someone who has you know, dramatically more engagement than the median user. And if we're saying, well, this index is pretty selective for most users of choosing that all the interactions for a given user, so we're going to use that even for the users for which it's not selective because there are billions and billions of interactions with their posts, the query is going to be very slow. Right? And if we're launching a new service, we might not have historical data for how we would perform in a situation where we have a skewed distribution like that, but we can simulate that distribution and see how our system would would react to that kind of data. So there are a lot of strategies for addressing skew. Again, the purpose of generating synthetic data is to see if you're susceptible to that. We see this in conventional database systems too. If a key value is skewed, we might use the wrong index, the wrong join strategy, the wrong execution plan in general, and we could see a similarly, similarly pathological result. Another example is looking at machine production machine learning pipelines. So in a production machine learning inference pipeline, you start with raw data, which is from your program, from an API gateway, from a database, you know, whatever, it's structured data. You have a feature extraction pipeline that turns this into vectors often. You have a model inference where you actually evaluate the model against those feature vectors, and then you return a prediction. So in a lot of cases, we care about the throughput and latency of this model serving, and it may or may not be sensitive to the actual data that we're asking for predictions on. So we can generate sensible data as quickly as possible in order to sort of get an upper bound on the performance of our system. And the nice thing about doing this with synthetic data is that we can evaluate multiple parts of the system separately. We can generate synthetic raw data and say, what does it look like if I get a lot of data from the API endpoint? Is this feature extraction pipeline going to be the bottleneck in my system? We can evaluate the model serving part independently by generating different synthetic data sets just of data in the feature space. We can also, using some of the techniques we might use in modeling a database workload, actually test feature store interactions. So if we have a feature store and we're assembling features from some data that are arriving dynamically and some data that we're looking up somewhere else, we can model that as well. And getting these pipelines right can be very tricky, so being able to test them before we actually put them into production is valuable. Machine learning systems in general are complicated and can fail in a lot of ways, some of which are just ordinary, boring, distributed system ways to fail. They're not really not really that boring, right? And some of them are specific to machine learning, but we want to be able to test how our system behaves with a range of inputs, with a variety of unexpected inputs, and just sort of seeing if we can detect failures. If the distribution of things that our users are doing changes over time, will we know, or will our model just be making bad predictions? Uh, these are the important things that we might want to be able to answer. Another application is avoiding reliance on a data set that we can't use. I really enjoyed Jen Ding's thought-provoking keynote yesterday because if we like it or not, bespoke licenses from models, data sets, and increasingly software are here to stay. And we need to think about how these licenses affect our communities, our ecosystems, and the state of practice. So, some of these licenses include clauses that can prevent us from trying to teach people about techniques, data processing or machine learning techniques, or share implementations of our systems under free and open source software licenses. So I want to talk about three kinds of restrictions here that we might want to work around by generating synthetic data that are similarly useful. The first example is a commercial use restriction. This seems pretty simple, right? What is commercial use? You're making money, it's commercial use, right? So I actually think this gets tricky, because if I'm conducting research inside a company and I want to publish it, is that commercial use? If I want to publish it in an open access journal, is that commercial use? What if I'm developing open source software, but it's part of my job duties? 
What do we think? Yes or no? Commercial use? Apache licensed software, but I'm, I'm getting paid to do it. How about presenting at a community conference? How about presenting at a for-profit conference, but not being paid to do it? So commercial use, I think, is a really vague concept, and it's never really defined in these licenses. And you'd think that people would consider sort of, well, what am I saying when I say you can't use this data set commercially? But every time I've asked, I've found that people don't have a good answer. The people who are telling me I can't use a data set commercially don't have a good answer either. My, one of my favorite examples is a colleague and I were giving a workshop at a data science conference in the US, and we wanted to use a media recommendation data set to basically show a different way to do recommendations. And the data set itself said, no commercial use. But we weren't being paid to present the tutorial. We were being paid our salaries, but the conference wasn't paying us. Uh, the tutorial itself was permissively licensed open source code, and it only depended on permissively licensed open source code. So we thought, well, this probably isn't commercial use, but we should check. So we contacted the, uh, contacted the distributor of the data set and said, well, this is where we are. You know, in the interest of completeness, the company that runs this conference runs it as a for-profit enterprise, but it's not our for-profit enterprise. What do you think? And the answer was, I don't know. Talk to your lawyer. So we decided to generate synthetic data for this problem instead. Another problem that you see with licenses that's a little clearer cut is redistribution. A lot of data sets will say, you can download this and do whatever you want with it, but you can't share it with anyone else. Now, the problem with this is it makes it really difficult to release a system under a permissive open source license that depends on this kind of data, but it also turns the original data set into a single point of failure. How many times have you seen a GitHub repository or a Jupyter notebook or a blog post that says, start by downloading this data set and the data set isn't there anymore? If it were possible to just make a copy of this unmodified data set and share it under the same terms, a lot of those things would still work. Right? The final example, I think, is licenses that forbid particular applications or use cases. And we don't see these as often in data sets as we see them with models. But there is some precedent in the software world. And communities, open source communities, really widely avoid these licenses. Right? You can't package something with a usage restriction for Debian or Fedora and get it included in the main distribution. I'm really sympathetic to people who say, there is awesome power in this technology, and we want to make sure people aren't using it for something terrible. But I think that a lot of times, these licenses with use case restrictions either just prevent people from using your software at all, because the usage restrictions are vague, or they just reinforce existing power dynamics, because the question becomes not, is this legitimately a permissive use, but can I argue in public opinion or in court that this is a permissive use? So companies that are inclined to violate these licenses will probably decide to do so anyway. Something to consider, right? All of these languages vague, it's difficult, but in any case, we have a lot of encumbered data sets that would be useful if we could use them more broadly, and synthetic data is a way to get around this. So I want to go philosophical for a second here. What are we trying to accomplish when we make synthetic data? Are we just trying to make a data set that looks like another data set? It's usually, usually an important condition, but I don't think it's the whole story, right? The data isn't really the point of synthetic data. The interesting thing about a data set is that it reflects something we care about from the real world, right? This data set may not be perfect. I mean, no data set is perfect. It may be coarsely sampled. It may be too coarsely sampled to capture the phenomenon we want to observe. It may reflect the effects of something that we can't capture directly rather than the phenomenon itself. And you know, it may, not, may just not contain all of the kinds of values we need. We may not have observed all the things we care about. But we care about this data because it reflects the world and how we can use it to reason about the world. And when we're generating a synthetic data set, we want to generate a data set that looks like a real one, but we also want to be able to generate a data set that reflects a world that looks like ours, but which is easier to control. So I want to talk about some challenges now that are common to generating synthetic tabular data. And I want to start with this quotation by George Box of all models are wrong, but some are useful fame. And I, I really like the idea of saying, you're not going to be perfect, so think about what it's important to be wrong about 
rather than everything that you're possibly wrong about. And depending on your application, being wrong about synthetic data in one way or another is going to be more or less important. So for some applications, we really care about preserving the shape of columns in our data set. Each feature should have the same distribution in synthetic data as it does in actual data. We want to preserve the marginal distributions. In some data sets, we want to preserve the shape of rows. So our synthetic data should preserve correlations and constraints between columns in the actual data. In some applications, we care about preserving the shape of subsets of columns. Our synthetic data should inhabit a feature space, a joint distribution, in the same way that our actual data do. In some data sets, for some problems, time series problems in particular, we want to preserve relationships between rows. Our synthetic time series data should reflect maybe not the real world, but certainly a possible world. If you're modeling payments and you give someone a refund for a transaction that never happened, that data set is probably not as useful as a data set in which you only get refunds for things you actually bought. We might also want to model and preserve relationships across data sets. As we said when talking about databases, if you're dealing with query processing, cardinality, join cardinality, and skew, for example, are interesting. So again, our data aren't the world. They're observations of the world. And they might be imperfect, incomplete, or just a reflection of the thing we care about. But we want a way to generate data that can reflect the real world or a world related to our real world in the same way as our data. And a really important capability that we have if we think about how we model the world and generate data is we can model counterfactuals. We can change some things about the world or about the phenomenon that's generating the data we care about while keeping everything else equal to learn how our system will behave when faced with these changes. So an important pitfall to be aware of when we're thinking about making data sets that resemble other data sets is that for any meaningful definition of resemblance, you can find a lot of data sets that resemble one another in that way, but not in many other important ways. Probably the most famous example is this. This is Anscombe's quartet. This is four synthetic data sets that have the same summary statistics, the same regression line, but they look very different. If you were just generating data by saying, I want to generate a data set that satisfies the same summary statistics, you could generate any one of these, and it would be modeling something radically different. I think a more fun example is Alberto Cairo's Datasaurus, which uh, shows the importance of visualizing data. Here we have two features, x and y, that are both normally distributed. They have sort of a weak negative correlation. Uh, this QR code here points to a blog post that Cairo wrote about this data set. But if we just look at the summary statistics, we might assume all sorts of things about what generated the data when the answer is really someone drew a picture of a dinosaur and was trying to satisfy certain summary statistics. Now, the fun thing about the Datasaurus is that this work was actually extended by Justin Matieka and George Fitzmaurice to have a dozen additional data sets that have the same summary statistics and correlation coefficient. But as you can see, they all have radically different shapes. Uh, so the QR code in the lower right here points to a paper about how they generated these graphs. And I think these examples are really important because they show that any basic summary of a data set can hide meaningful details about its structure. Sometimes these details are obvious when we look at the data set, sometimes they aren't, right? But for our purposes in thinking about synthetic data, this means we need to be careful how we characterize a data set to model it. Our goal is not just to produce a data set that resembles another, it's to produce a data set that reflects the world or a world like our world in an interesting way. The example in the bottom left here is particularly interesting because the overall correlation is negative, but you see we have five subsets of the data that we could examine individually and assume that there's a very strong positive correlation. So uh, some of you know this as Simpson's paradox. I think this is a really nice graphical illustration of that. If we looked at any one of those subsets by accident, though, we'd be inclined to completely mischaracterize what was going on in the data. So for our case study here, I want to work with a freely available, but with some usage restrictions, data set from City Bike in New York City. Um, working with a subset of data, just trips happening in New York City proper from April 2023. I'm not going to do anything earth shattering or explain anything to you about micromobility in urban settings with this data set, but 
Uh, bike share data sets are common, commonly used in data science competitions. I think people have seen them a lot. Uh, this data set is familiar to many people. Many people who haven't been to New York are at least aware that there is a place called New York and that it has some islands and a lot of people in it. And I like bicycles, so, so here we are. So this is what the data set looks like. We have a bunch of features. We have a ride ID. We have a rideable type, which is whether someone is taking a conventional bicycle or an electric bicycle, or whether a bike is being removed from service, which is a very small percentage of our rideable types. We have start and end times. We have whether this person using the bike was doing a sort of one-off short-term rental or whether they had a recurring membership with the bike service. And then we have details about where the ride started and ended. We have a station ID, a station name, and latitude and longitude for the start and end points. Now the station ID and the station name are, are basically going to be fixed every time you go to a station, but the latitude and longitude are actually from sensor data, so they're a little bit variable because they're noisy, right? Now what do we notice? What's the first thing you notice looking at this data set? Just looking at these columns. Are all of these features in this data set equally informative? Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of people shaking their heads, but maybe people are, are afraid to talk or just waiting for lunch. Um, not all of these features are going to be equally informative. We have a lot of correlations, right? The end time, always going to be after the start time. The station ID, if you have a given station ID, you are always going to have the same station name. Your start latitude and start longitude are always going to be in the neighborhood of GPS resolution, right, for that, for that data set, so for that data point. So there are a lot of things in this data that, that mean that um, not all these features are equally informative. We have a lot of correlations, and these are things we'll have to worry about, and we'll see, we'll see how we deal with those in a bit. I think one interesting thing about this data, too, is that like a lot of real-world things, some things are much more popular than others. Here we have a plot of start points by popularity. Um, it's so dense on Manhattan Island that you can't even see the most popular start points, but um, it's over you know, 14,000 trips in, you know, out of, I think, 800,000 total trips in, in April, starting at, uh, no, it's, uh, sorry, several million trips in April, starting at, uh, starting in sort of central Manhattan. And then, you know, if we, see, if we look out uh, towards, towards LaGuardia Airport in the upper right-hand uh, corner of the map, we see some very small dots that just have a few trips originating there. So we can, we can see that sort of looking at the distribution of where things are actually happening is going to be interesting and enable us to more, sort of more faithfully model what this data set is representing. So if we're thinking about generating synthetic data, the absolute simplest thing we can do is just sample from the marginal distributions of each features. Actually, we can do something even simpler than that, right? We can just say, I have a data set, I'm gonna shuffle each feature individually, right? So the next simplest way is to sample from the marginal distributions of each feature. If we know how each feature is dis distributed, we can model each feature by its distribution parameters, but as I already said, I'm not a statistician and I'm not gonna pretend to know how each feature is distributed, so we'll look at some ways to do this empirically as well. So again, sampling each feature individually, if we have some, if we have some cards with, uh, with French suits here, we, we, can, we can say, I'm just gonna shuffle each, each column while keeping the, um, you know, shuffle each column independently like this, and then I get some synthetic data. And this is very easy to do in, in Python, not particularly efficient, but it will work. Um, if we want to instead look at distributions, well, because we have a discrete number of possibilities, this is, this is fairly easy. We say feature one, there's a 60% chance that it's a heart and a 20% chance that it's either a club or a spade and, and so on, right? This is, this is pretty straightforward for, for these discrete valued features. If we're looking at continuously valued features, we, we will want to think about cumulative distributions or, or marginal distributions more generally, but we run into a very similar problem that we run into with the data source, right? Which is that if our data are meaningful or if our data exhibit correlations, we're not going to get a data set that looks a lot like our data set just by sampling from the marginals, right? So here are two examples where we have the same marginal distributions, but wildly different shapes. We have a perfect 
perfect uh, positive correlation here on one side, and we have just uniform random values on the other. Um, another example where some of the feature space is not inhabited at all, but we have the same marginal distributions. Um, I'm not you know, sufficiently creative to draw really exciting pictures, but if we look at you know, circles, we still see this data set that, that sort of um, isn't obvious on the right-hand side that, that it could have been the same distribution that we see on the left-hand side. So this is something that we have to, we have to keep in mind and, and worry about, but we can see this by visualizing, visualizing the data. And we'll talk about how, it's, how this is useful even if we produce a picture like the one on the right for the data set that's on the left. So in a lot of real world phenomena, extreme values are a lot more likely than they are in you know, what we think of as a typical distribution like the normal distribution or the exponential distribution. If we don't choose an appropriate way to model these data, we're gonna underestimate the likelihood of extreme values. So, and a lot of real systems are very sensitive to these extreme values. If you have a transaction processing system where your critical section has a mean latency of half a millisecond, but a 99th percentile latency of five seconds and a 99.9 .9 percentile latency of 60 seconds, you may never finish, right? Depending on how many, how many records you get. So we can't always model the distribution. We might not always want to, but we can sample and get a cumulative distribution that we've observed empirically. And this is what we have here. So the y values means the probability that an observed value is less than or equal to x. We've generated this cumulative distribution by sampling 1,000 trips. The median trip is right around 10 minutes. Now, if we sample 100,000 trips, the median trip is still right around 10 minutes, but the longest trip we see goes from just under a day to over 22 days. This is a bike that was taken out of service. It's not someone who's just exhausting themselves continually riding around New York. But we see that these extreme values are only gonna come up if we can really faithfully model this distribution. A good way to do this efficiently is to use a sketch. There are a few techniques for doing this, the moment sketch, the DD sketch. Because we're at buzzwords, I wanna point you to Ted Dunning. This is QR code will take you to a talk that he gave at Buzzwords 2018 on the T-Digest, which he invented, which is an efficient way to model cumulative distributions. You can use it for generating synthetic data and a whole bunch of other interesting features. So if we just have these samples from marginals, we've seen cases why it might not be useful, but what can we do that's interesting with these things? Well, one idea is to evaluate the throughput of things that process a single row at a time. Again, inference services are an example, stateless stream processors are another. We could use these samples from marginals to fuzz test our machine learning systems, just give it a lot of unexpected inputs and see if it crashes, right? See if we detect where it goes wrong. And another interesting thing that we can do that I think is, is actually a really cool application is we can train a model to distinguish between real and synthetic data and use this to identify how important the features are in the real data. So we'll see, we'll see more of that now. So what I did was I took that bike share data and I perturbed the columns. So I had a set of synthetic observations that were sampled from the marginals and I had the real data and then I labeled those subsets. I said, the real data are real and the synthetic data are not real. And I trained an XGBoost model to distinguish between these two. This XGBoost model performed extraordinarily well. We had an F1 score of one. Um, I, I did hold out a test set. This is not, not overfitting, right? But what we see here is that the features that were important in distinguishing between real and synthetic data are all the features that we called out as having correlations, right? So what the XGBoost model is learning here is that if we have a real thing, this station ID is gonna to correspond to this station name. If we have a synthetic thing, it's not. Right, so how can we handle this when we generate data? Well, we can still sample from the marginals, but we can do some things to make this process a little smarter. For one, we can ensure that our end time is always after our start time, right? Another thing we can do is say, 
if we have a start station ID, we can look up what the station name is rather than sampling it because there's going to be a correlation between those values. Similarly, we know that a start station ID is going to correspond to a very small geographical area of where the, where the ride ended. So if we generate it, and similarly for the end station ID and name, if we incorporate these insights into our synthetic data, if we just change the data set so that the end time is always after the start time and we look up the station name based on the station ID and we look up the start and start a latitude and longitude based on the station ID rather than sampling those, the uh, feature importances stay very similar, but the predictive performance of the model gets a lot worse. Right? So we've produced data that looks a lot more like the data from the real world, even though we've done something very simple. We've just sort of taken into account some things that we know, some things that we know and some things that we learned from looking at these feature importances in order to, in order to capture, capture those relationships more faithfully. So the next thing I want to look at is how we can sample from joint distributions. And I want to look at joint distributions of discrete features here, uh, because that's the most interesting for the bike share use case. And it's also much easier to do than sampling from observed joint distributions of continuous features. So the basic idea here is that instead of sampling from individual features, we make a sort of combined feature out of the product of two features and sample from that. So if we think about all of the possible combinations that we'd see in columns F1 and F2, well, we have, we have a few different possible, we have 32 possible combinations. And some of these actually happen in our data set and some of them don't. But we can sort of identify the ones that happen and identify how common they are and sort of produce a probability for these for these combinations of values and sample from that. And there are a couple of equivalent ways we can talk about this. We could say, what's the probability that we had a bike trip starting at one point and ending at another? Um, this is the most popular start and end point pair we have in the bike data set. It's um, seven hundredths of a percent of trips happened between these two stations. Or we could say, given that we started at this space, what's the probability that we ended at this other station, and then multiply that by the probability that we started at the station we started at, and we get the same, get the same result. See, the interesting thing here is that the probability that, we, the probability that we ended at the at Greenwich Street and Hubert Street, given that we started at Washington and late, is actually 51%, but we have, we have the much smaller percentage if we consider the probability that we started at Washington and late in the first place. Now, the interesting thing about the bike share data is that we have 3.47 million possible pairs of start and end stations, but not all of these are equally likely. 25% of trips are between 8,600 station pairs. So for those of you who are quickly pulling out your calculator, that means that a quarter percent, a quarter of a percent of station pairs account for 25% of trips. If we sample from this cumulative distribution of station pairs, we can more faithfully represent the trips that people are actually taking. The next topic I'd like to address is how we can take some things that we know about the real world that generated this data that we care about and use it to make our synthetic data more realistic. If you're used to working in machine learning, some of these techniques will be familiar to you as feature engineering techniques, but you may not have thought about them in this context. So I want to focus on examples involving time. Modeling start and end independently doesn't make that much sense. Instead, if we derive a trip duration from start and end times, we can model something more meaningful by modeling when start times happen and how long trips are. Some of you may have already noticed that I had a trip duration field earlier. Thank you for not calling me out on it, letting me get to this point in the talk. By modeling this trip duration, we can, we can sort of more faithfully talk about what's actually happening here. So this is a cumulative distribution of ride start times, and I've generated this by taking 15 percentiles from this data set and drawing a line between them. It appears that rides are more or less equally likely to happen at any time. Although we can see that the slope of the line starts to change around the 95th percentile. 
I'm going to think about why that is. We'll come back to it. If we actually plot the cumulative distribution from all the data, it's clear that rides are not equally likely to start at any time. There are periods in which ride starts are more likely, where this line is steeper, and where they're less likely, where the line is flatter. So it can be tricky to model a cumulative distribution without taking a lot of samples, but this example shows that even if we don't have extreme values, we still have to worry about how many samples we're modeling our cumulative distribution from. But of course, if we think about time in a different way, and we say, well, time is not just this linear thing that people experience you know, linearly, no matter how jet lagged they are, real data exhibits seasonality, right? You're much more likely to go for a bike ride when you're commuting to or from your office than you are in the middle of the night. And we also notice that people sleep in on weekends and stay up later on weekends. All right, let's come back to this uh, sampled cumulative distribution. Why do we think that our demand for bicycle trips is leveling off here? Yeah, it could be a holiday. Um, so actually, the end of April was a weekend. And it was also rainy and 9 degrees Celsius in New York City. So we just happened to catch the last day and a half at the 95th percentile. And, and that's, why it, that's why it levels off there. But Things in the real world impact our data, right? We need, to, we need to consider those. So another approach here is to just think about simulating the phenomena that generate the data. Our goal isn't just to replicate a data set, it's to model the world. And there are all sorts of things happening in the world that are not in our data, but that are reflected in our data. If we model these things, we can simulate the processes that generate data. The challenge of this approach is that we have to make a useful model of the world in order to make realistic data, but the nice thing is we can use our domain knowledge to avoid impossible data sets and also model counterfactuals. So if we model the number of bikes we have and how they go from station to station, we'll end up in a situation, we'll never end up in a situation where our data imply we have an ever expanding number of bikes, right? If we can also model the impact of how changing our maintenance policies might affect availability or how public holidays or events like parades and concerts might impact system demand. So I want to close quickly by pointing you to some things that you might want to learn next. So a theme of this talk is that good synthetic data is application development and needs to reflect the world in interesting ways. With some of these modeling insights in hand, you're prepared to look at both more automated ways to solve this problem and more involved ways to solve this problem. Any one of these is going to be a separate talk or two or three by itself, so I'm just giving you pointers to things that you might want to look at. There's a lot of work on automated machine learning techniques for generating synthetic tabular data. Variational autoencoders model feature spaces as approximate probability distributions. They're quick to train and can produce plausible results. Generative adversarial networks can produce very good tabular data, but they're trickier and more expensive to train. Finally, if you're working with time series, you should look at transformer models. Uh, there's a tabformer open source project from IBM that's a very interesting approach to generating synthetic tabular data. If you want to dive deeper into modeling and simulation, if you want to say, hey, how do I know that my assumptions about what's generating this data are actually plausible, you should look at probabilistic programming systems like PyMC, Pyro, and Stan, which provide a disciplined way to refine our models of latent variables and comparing the joint distributions of the synthetic data that we've produced to the real world data that we might see in the real world. If you're interested in synthetic data for privacy, I would advise you to look at differential privacy Simply having marginal distributions isn't always enough to prevent someone from identifying a natural person with your system. We had a few talks at Buzzwords this year on using synthetic data to improve our specialized LLMs in the context of search systems. I'm going to call out the two I attended yesterday. There are a bunch of recordings I need to catch up on as well. But Melinda and Yo Christian both gave excellent talks on using synthetic language data to improve language and search systems. So we talked about how synthetic data reflects the world, and how by generating synthetic data, we can reflect a world that is like, but not exactly like our world. We talked about some things to look out for in how we characterize data sets. And we talked about how we can use our domain knowledge to make a better approximation of the world in synthetic data. I'd love to hear about what you're doing in this space. Please keep in touch. I'm at Will B on Twitter and GitHub. You can reach me by email. I have a Mastodon account. I have not posted any public posts on it yet, but I know people are using Mastodon instead of Twitter, so I'm mentioning this as well. Th it's great to be at Buzzwords. Really appreciate this opportunity to spend time with you. <laughs>